Sir Isaac Newton When Isaac was 18, Master Stokes was so well impressed with his star scholar that he called in the young lad's uncle, the Reverend Mr. Ayscough, and insisted that the boy be sent to Cambridge. The uncle, being a Cambridge man himself, thought this the proper thing to do. On June 5, 1661, Isaac presented his credentials from his uncle and Mr. Stokes and was duly entered in Trinity College as a subsizer, which means that he was admitted on suspicion. A part of the duties of a subsizer was to clean boots, scrub floors, and perform various other delightful tasks which everybody else evaded. To be at Trinity College in any capacity was paradise for this boy. He thirsted for knowledge, to know, to do, to perform. These things were his desire. He had been brought up to work anyway, and to a country boy toil is no punishment. I knew that if worse came to worst, I could get work in the town making furniture and earn a man's wage, he said. In a month he had passed his first examinations and was made a sizer. Before this he had been fagged to everybody, but now he was fagged to the seniors only. He not only made their beds and cleaned their rooms, but also worked their examples in mathematics and thus commanded their respect. Once being called upon in class to recite from Euclid, he declined and shocked the professor by saying, It is a trifling book. I have mastered it and thrown it aside. And it was no idle boast. He knew the book as the professor did not. When he arrived at Cambridge, he carried in his box a copy of Sanderson's Logic presented to him by his uncle the uncle having no use for it. It happened to be one of the textbooks in use at Trinity. When Isaac heard lectures on Sanderson, he found he knew the book a deal better than the tutor, a thing the tutor shortly acknowledged before the class. This caused young Mr. Newton to stand out as a prodigy. Usually students have to rap for admittance to the higher classes, but now the teachers came and sought him out. One professor told him that he was about to take up Kepler's optics with some postgraduate students. Would young Mr. Newton come in? Isaac begged to be excused until he could examine the book. The volume was loaned to him. He tore the vitals out of it and digested them. When the lectures began, he declined to go because he had mastered the subject as far as Kepler carried it. Genius seems to consist in the ability to concentrate your rays and focus them on one point. Isaac Newton could do it. On a winter day I took a small glass and so centered the sun's rays that I burned a hole in my coat, he wrote in his subsizer journal. The youth possessed an imperturbable coolness. He talked little, but when he spoke it was very frankly and honestly. From any other his words would have had a presumptuous and boastful sound. As it was, he was respected and beloved. At Cambridge his face and features commended him. He looked like another Cambridge man, one Milton, John Milton, only his face was a little more stern in its expression than that of the author of Paradise Lost. In two years' time, Isaac Newton was a scholar of whom all Cambridge knew. He had prepared able essays on the squaring of curved and crooked lines, on errors in grinding lenses and the methods of rectifying them, and in the extraction of roots where the cubes were imperfect. He had done things never before attempted by his teachers. When they called upon him to recite, it was only for the purpose of explaining truths which they had not mastered. In 1664, being in his 22nd year, Isaac Newton was voted a free scholarship which provided for board, books, and tuition. On this occasion he was examined in Euclid by Dr. Barrow, the headmaster of Trinity. Newton could solve every problem, but could not explain why or how. His methods were empirical, those of his own. Many men with a modicum of mathematical genius work in this way, and in practical life the plan may serve all right. But now it was shown to Newton that a schoolman must not only know how to work out great problems, but also why he goes at it in a certain way. Otherwise colleges are vain. We must be able to pass our knowledge along. The really great man is one who knows the rules and then forgets them, just as the painter of supreme merit must be a realist before he evolves into an impressionist. Newton now acknowledged his mistake in reference to Euclid and set to work to master the rules. This graciousness in accepting advice and the willingness to admit his lapse, if he had been hasty, won for him not only the scholarship but also the love of his superiors. Milton was a radical who made enemies, but Newton was a radical who made friends. 
He avoided iconoclasm, left all matters of theology to the specialists, and accepted the church as a necessary part of society. His care not to offend fixed his place in Cambridge for life. It was Cambridge that fostered and encouraged his first budding experiments. It was there he was sustained in his mightiest hazards, and it was within her walls that the ripe fruit of his genius was garnered and gathered. When his fame had become national and he was called to higher offices than Cambridge supplied, Cambridge watched his career with the loving interest of a mother and the debt of love he fully paid, for it was very largely through his name and fame that Cambridge first took her place as one of the great schools of the world. Newton took his degree of Bachelor of Arts at Cambridge in January in the year 1665. The faculty of Trinity would not even consider his leaving the college. He was as valuable to them as he would be now if he were a famous football player. Besides the scholarship, there were ways provided so he could earn money by private tutoring and giving lectures in the absence of the professors. He had written his essay on fluxions, described their application to fluents and tangents, and devised a plan for finding the radius of curvity in crooked lines. In August of the same year that Newton was given his degree, the college was dismissed on account of an epidemic, and Newton went home to Woolsthorpe to kill time. In September 1665, he then being 23, while seated in his mother's garden, Newton saw that storied apple fall. What pulled it down? Some force tugging at it, surely. Galileo had experimented with falling bodies, and had proved that the weight and size of a falling body had nothing to do with its velocity, save as its size and shape might be affected by the friction of the atmosphere. The first person to put into print the story of the falling apple was Voltaire, whose sketch of Newton is a little classic which the world could ill afford to lose. Adam, William Tell, and Isaac Newton each had his little affair with the apple, but with different results. The falling apple suggested to Newton that there was some power in the ground that was constantly pulling things toward the center of the earth. This power extended straight down into the earth, he knew it. He had dropped a stone into a mine, and had also dropped things from steeples. He dropped apples from kites by an ingenious device of two strings, and he concluded that an apple taken a hundred miles up in the air would return to earth. He then began to speculate as to just what a body would do a thousand or ten thousand miles from the earth. So high as we could go, or as deep as we could dig, this drawing power was always present. The law of gravitation. If a cannonball was fired in a straight line at a distant target, the gunner had to elevate the aim if he would hit the target, for the ball described a curve and would keep dropping to the earth until it struck the ground. Something was pulling it down. What was it? The law of gravitation. The moon was attracted toward us and would surely fall into us, but for the fact that there were other attractions drawing her toward them. The movements of the planets were owing to the fact that they were obeying attractions. They were moving in curves, just like cannonballs in motion. They had two movements also, like the cannonball. Newton had noticed that the stars within a certain territory all moved in similar directions, and so must be acted upon by the same influences. The law of gravitation. It is held by many people in East Aurora and elsewhere that Newton's invention is a devilish device originated for the benefit of surgeons and crockery dealers, but this is not wholly true. Without this law of gravitation, the Earth could not retain her spherical shape. Only through this constant drawing in toward the center could she exist. The other planets, too, must be round, or they could not exist, and so they also had the same quality of gravity in common with the Earth, a drawing in of everything toward the center. Here was clearly a positive discovery, the similarity of the heavenly bodies. Every one of the heavenly bodies was exerting a constant attraction toward all other heavenly bodies, and this attractive power must be in proportion to the distance they were from the object acted upon. Thus were their movements and orbits accounted for. At this time, Newton was perfectly familiar with Kepler's law, that the squares of the periodic times of a planet were as the cubes of its distance from the sun and from this he inferred that the attraction varied as the square of the planet's distance from the sun. Here he was working on territory that had never been surveyed. At first, in his exuberance, he thought to figure out the size and weight of each planet quickly by measuring its attractive power. 
He did not realize that he had cut out for himself work that would require many men and several centuries to cover, but surely he was on the right scent, a finite man keen upon the secrets of the infinite. He was still at his mother's old home in the country, without scientific apparatus or the stimulus of colleagues, when we find by a record in his journal that antique groan, because there were only 24 hours in a day, and that eight were required for sleep, and eight more for recreation. A subject a little nearer home than planetary attraction had now switched him off for measuring and weighing the stars. He was hard at work in his mother's little sitting room, with the windows darkened, much to that good woman's perplexity. By shutting out all light from the windows, and allowing the sun's rays to enter by a little circular aperture, he had gotten the sunlight captured and tamed to where he could study it. This ray of light he examined with a small hand glass he himself had made. In looking at the ray, quite accidentally, he found it could be deflected and sent off at will in various directions. When thrown on the wall, instead of being simply white light, it had seven distinct colors, beginning with violet and running down to red. So white light was not a single element. It was made up of various rays which had to be united in order to give us sunlight. Eureka! He had found the secret of the rainbow, the sun's rays broken up and separated by the refracting agency of clouds. Well does Darwin declare that the separation of sunlight into its component parts and the invention of the spectrum have marked an advance in man's achievement such as the world had not seen since the time of wonder-working Archimedes. The Cambridge University was closed until October, year of 1667. Most of the intervening time Newton spent at the home of his mother, but from accounts of his we can see that the college people kept their eagle eye upon him, for they sent remittances to him regularly for commons. When he returned to Cambridge he was assigned to the spiritual chamber, which was a room next to the chapel that had formerly been reserved as a guest room for visiting dignitaries. In March 1668 he was given the degree of Master of Arts. His studies now were of a very varied kind. He was required to give one lecture a week on any subject of his own choosing. Needless to say, his themes were all mathematical or scientific. Just what they were can best be inferred by consulting his cash book, since the lectures themselves were not written out and all memoranda concerning them have disappeared. This account book shows that his expenditures were for a Gunter's book, he who invented the Gunter's chain, a magnet and a compass, glue, bulbs, putty, antimony, vinegar, white lead, salts of tartar, and lenses. And in addition there were a few interesting items such as one sees in the diary of George Washington. Lost at cards, five shillings. Treating at tavern, ten shillings. Binding my Bible, three shillings. Spent on my cousin, one pound, two. Expenses for wedding my degree, sixteen shillings. The last item shows that times have changed but little. The scientist and philosopher par excellence had to moisten his diploma at the tavern for the benefit of good fellows who little guessed with whom they drank. He also had poor relations come to visit him, and it is significant that while there are various items showing where he lost money at cards, there are no references to any money won at the same business, from which we infer that while there was no one at Cambridge who could follow him in his studies, there yet were those who could deal themselves better hands when it came to the pasteboards. Evidently, he got discouraged at playing cards, for after the year 1668, there are no more items of treating at the tavern or lost at cards. The boys had tried to educate him, but had not succeeded. In card exploitations, he fell a victim of arrested development. I suppose it will not cause anyone a shock to be told that the greatest thinker of all time was not exactly a perfect man. So let the truth be known that throughout his life Newton had a well-defined strain of superstitious belief running through his character. He never quite relinquished the idea of transmutation of metals, and at times astrology was quite as interesting to him as astronomy. In writing to a friend who was about to pay a long visit to the mines of Hungary, he says, Examine most carefully and ascertain just how and under what conditions nature transforms iron into copper and copper into silver and gold. In his laboratory he had specimens of iron ore that contained copper, and also samples of copper ore that contained gold, 
and from this he argued that these metals were transmutable, and really in the act of transmutation when the process was interfered with by the miner's pick. He had transformed a liquid into a mass of solid crystals instantly, and all of the changes possible in light which he had discovered had enlarged his faith to a point where he declared, nothing is impossible. It is somewhat curious that Isaac Newton, who had no soft sex sentiment in his nature, quite unlike Galileo, still believed in alchemy and astrology, while Galileo's cold intellect at once perceived the fallacy of these things. Galileo also saw at once that for the sun to stand still at Joshua's command would really mean that the earth must cease her motion, since the object desired was to prolong the day. Sir Isaac Newton, who discovered the law of gravitation, it believed that at the command of a barbaric chieftain, this law was arrested, and that all planetary attraction was made to cease while he fought the Philistines for the possession of pasture land, to which he had no title. Galileo did not know as much as Newton about planetary attraction, but very early in his career he perceived that the Bible was not a book that could be relied upon technically. With Newton the Bible presented no difficulties. He regularly attended church and took part in the ritual. Religion was one thing, and his daily work another. He kept his religion as completely separate from his life as did Gladstone, who believed the Mosaic account of creation was literally true, and yet had a clear, cool, calculating head for facts. The greatest financial exploiter in America today is an Orthodox Christian, taking an active part in missionary work and the spread of the Gospel. In his family he is gentle, kind, and tender. He is a good neighbor, a punctilious churchgoer, a leader in Sunday school, and a considerate teacher of little children. In business relations, he is as conscienceless as Tamerlane, who built a mountain of skulls as a monument to himself. He is cold, calculating, and if opposed, vindictive. On occasion, he is absolutely without heart. Compassion, mercy, or generosity are not then in his makeup. The best lawyers procurable are paid princely sums to study for him. The penal code and legislatures have even revised it for his benefit. Eviction, destruction, suicide, and insanity have even trod in his train. A picture of him makes you think of that dark and gloomy canvas where Caesar, Alexander, and Napoleon ride slowly side by side through a sea of stiffened corpses. Bribery, coercion, violence, and even murder have been this man's weapons. He is the richest man in America, and yet, as I said in the beginning, all this represents only one side of his nature. He reads his chapter in the Bible each evening by his family fireside, and tenderly kisses his grandchildren good night. The individual who imagines that embezzlers are all riotous in nature, and by habit are spendthrifts, does not know humanity. The embezzler is one man, the model citizen another, and yet both souls reside in the one body. Nero had a passion for pet pigeons, and the birds used to come at his call, perch on his shoulder, and take dainty crumbs from his lips. The natures of some men are divided up into watertight compartments. Sir Isaac Newton kept his religion in one compartment, and his science in another. They never got together. Voltaire has said, when Sir Isaac Newton discovered the law of gravitation, he excited the envy of the learned men of the world but they more than got even with him when he wrote a book on the prophecies of the Bible. When Newton was only 27 years old, he was elected the Lucasian Professor of Mathematics at Trinity, an office that carried with it a goodly salary and also very much honor. Never before had so young a man held this chair. Newton was a pioneer in announcing the physical properties of light. Every village photographer now fully understands this, but when Newton first proclaimed it, he created a whirlwind of disapproval. When a man at that time put forth an unusual thought, it was regarded as a challenge. Teachers and professors all over Great Britain, and also in Germany and France, at once set about to show the fallacy of Newton's conclusions. Newton had issued a pamphlet with diagrams showing how to study light, and the apparatus was so simple and cheap that the Newton experiments were tried everywhere in schoolrooms. People always combat a new idea when first presented, and so Newton found himself overwhelmed with correspondence. Cheap arguments were fired into Cambridge in volleys. These were backed up by quibbling men, pro bono publico, veritas and old subscriber, men incapable of following Newton's scientific mind. In his great good nature and patience, Newton replied to his opponents at length. 
His explanations were construed into proof that he was not sure of his ground. One man challenged him to debate the matter publicly, and we hear of his going up to London, king that he was, to argue with a commoner. Such terms as falsifier, upstart, pretender, were freely used, and poor Newton, for a time, was almost in despair. He had thought that the world was anxious for truth. Some of his fellow professors now touched their foreheads and shook their heads ominously as he passed. He had gone so far beyond them that the cries of woe were unnoticed. It is here worth noting that the universal fame of Sir Isaac Newton was brought about by his rancorous enemies, and not by his loving friends. Gentle, honest, simple and direct as was his nature, he experienced notoriety before he knew fame. To the world at large he was a wizard and a juggler, before he was acknowledged a teacher of truth, a man of science. When the dust of conflict concerning Newton's announcement of the qualities of light had somewhat subsided, he turned to his former discovery, the law of gravitation, and bent his mighty mind upon it. The influence of the moon upon the earth, the tilt of the earth, the flattening of the poles, the recurring tides, the size, weight, and distance of the planets now occupied Newton's attention. And to study these phenomena properly, he had to construct special and peculiar apparatus. In 1687, the results of his discoveries were brought together in one great book, the Principia. Newton was 45 years old then. He was still the Cambridge professor, but was well known in political circles in London on account of having been sent there at various times to represent the university in a legal way. His diplomatic success led to his being elected a member of parliament. Among other great men whom he met in London was Samuel Pepys, who kept a diary and therein recorded various important nothings about Mr. Isaac Newton of Cambridge, a school teacher of degree with a great dignity of manner and pleasing countenance. It seems Newton thought so well of Pepys that he wrote him several letters, from which Samuel gives us quotations. Pepys really claimed the honor of introducing Newton into good society. Among others with whom Newton made friends in Parliament was Mr. Montague, who shortly afterward became Secretary of the Exchequer. Montague made his friend Newton a Warden of the Mint, with pay about double that which he had received while at Cambridge. In this public work, Newton brought such talent and diligence to bear that in 1697 he was made Master of the Mint at a salary of £1,500 a year, a princely sum in those days. There was no doubt that the fact that Newton was a devout churchman and an upholder of the established order was a great, although perhaps unconscious, diplomatic move. His delightful personality, gracious, suave, dignified and silent, won for him admiration wherever he would go. In argument his fine reserve and excellent temper were most convincing. Had he turned his attention to the law, he would have become Chief Justice of England. In 1703, he was elected President of the Royal Society, an office he held continuously for 25 years, and which tenure was only terminated by his death. In 1705, the Queen visited Cambridge, and there, with much pageantry, bestowed the honour of knighthood which changed Professor Newton into Sir Isaac Newton. But the man himself was still the simple, modest gentleman. The title did not spoil him. He was a noble man from boyhood. His duties as Master of the Mint did not interfere with his studies and scientific investigations. He revised and rewrote his Principia, and in 1713 the new edition was issued. One copy was most sumptuously bound, and Sir Isaac, who was a special favourite at court, presented it in person to the Queen. Those who are interested in such things may, by applying to the curator of the British Museum, see and turn the leaves of this book, reading the gracious inscription of the author while a solemn man in brass buttons stands behind. Newton died March 20th, 1727, at the age of 85, and was buried in Westminster Abbey. The verdict of humanity concerning Sir Isaac Newton has been summed up for us by Laplace. His work was preeminent above all other products of the human intellect. End of section 2